What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov Series. I'm going to continue to examine 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. And I took a look at Johnny Bratton, who was known as the Honey Boy. Now, let me tell you something about Johnny Bratton. My grandfather and father knew him well. In fact, my father had a locker in the same aisle way in Stillman's gym as Johnny Bratton. He was in the aisle way with Joe Sandy Sadler. He was in the aisle way with Sam Baruti. He was in the aisle way with Kid Gavilon. When Kid Gavilon would come in town, Johnny Bratton for that matter, because he was from Chicago. They would always come to Stillman's gym because Stillman's gym was close to New York's Madison Square Garden. So when these guys came out of town, that's the gym that they were training. Or they would go to Grubb's Gym on 116th Street. Or some other various gyms within the area. And from my understanding, Johnny Bratton was a dresser. He would have the slick hair, London fog, three-piece suit. He would have the wingtip shoes. Those shoes were shining like you won't believe, <laughs> according to my dad and grandfather. But Johnny Bratton, he could fight. And he had an imposter that would run around New York's Madison Square Garden, way after Johnny Bratton fought, you know. But Johnny Bratton was born September 9th, 1927 in Little Rock, Arkansas. He would die. August 15th, 1993, he was 65 years of age at the time of his death, and he would reside in Chicago, Illinois. I personally had the pleasure of meeting Johnny Bratton. And when I met him, he was still a young man. He was in his 50s at that time. And he, he was a kidder. You know, he was joke around and somewhat playful, if you will. Nice man, but Johnny Bratton was a hell of a fighter. He be in the ring with Gene Spencer. Fought him three times, two wins and one loss. Remember when he fought Melvin Johnson? We defeated him in eight rounds. Melvin Johnson fought a lot out of the Olympic Sporting Club, California. Bratton would be in the ring with Cleo Shane. Defeat him once and have one draw with him. Cleo Shane was another good fighter. He would face Willie Joyce, and that's what opened up a lot of eyes, because Willie Joyce, without hustle, Ike Williams, three separate occasions. Now, he defeated Willie Joyce twice in 10 round matches. That was very impressive. He would also face Danny Bang Bang Wapner and Vic Cardell, Lester Felton, Pierre Langlois, who was a very hard puncher, Laurent Dottil, He'd be in the ring with Joe Brown. They called him the Old Bones. He would have 12 title defenses in his light year reign. A lightweight championship reign. But Johnny Bratton would lose eight rounds to Bo Jack because he would suffer broken jaw in Chicago. He would lose to Ike Williams. And Ike Williams was a hard puncher, but he was a lightweight champion. And Johnny Bratton would be in there with Ike Williams for nine rounds. And he would fight almost the entire ninth round with a broken jaw. He being there with Kit Gavilon, Ruby Goldstein, would be the referee for that fight. He would fight the entire fight with a broken jaw. You see, Johnny Bratton had brittle hands, and his jaw never healed in between fights. He was a warrior. He would spit out gobs of blood when he got back to the locker room. And he would swallow blood most of the time to prevent from having a referee to stop in the fight. 
You see, that's how the men were during those days. They wanted to fight. They didn't want the fight stopped. They didn't want any excuses. They would continue to perform until they were literally knocked out, if need be. Now, when he fought Ike Williams, who was at the Coliseum Arena, New Orleans. Then he would fight him in Philadelphia. March 14, 1951. He would defeat New Jersey's Charlie Fuseri. And that would be for the NBA welterweight championship strap. Now, Charlie Fuseri would be Ray Robinson's last welterweight title defense. Ray Robinson would give up the belt because he wanted to challenge Marcel Sedan. Instead, he would wind up meeting Jake LaMotta. And he faced Jake LaMotta six separate occasions. Defeated him in 42, lost him in 43, had a, a rematch with him in 43, six weeks later. In between that bout, he would have a fight with California Jackie Wilson. I'm speaking of Ray Robinson. But Johnny Bratton would win the NBA Welterweight Championship crown in front of 6,954 spectators. May 18, 1951, he would lose 15 rounds to Kit Gavilon. And in the fifth round, he would suffer a broken jaw. Ruby Goldstein, keep a close eye on that hanging jaw. And as I stated, Johnny Bratton would swallow blood. And he would spit out gobs of blood in the bucket in between rounds. And when he went back to the locker room, he would be nauseous and be dizzy. But he would continue to fight because that's how these men fought. That's just how it was. November 28th, 1951, he would draw 10 rounds with Kid Gavilon. You see, Kid Gavilon was another fighter. Didn't give a damn who he was in there with. And I'll be talking about Kid Gavilon because he will be listed in this series as well. But he had a fight in 1952 in Philadelphia, the hometown of the great Gil Turner. My God, what a fight that was. And it's fights like that that made the 40s and the 50s special. Johnny Bratton would be in the ring with Del Flanagan. Albert Chalky Wright. Chalky Wright was the featherweight champion of the world when he would defeat Joey Archibald. He would lose his crown to Woody Pep. He was something else. He would unfortunately drown in the bathtub. He would be a chauffeur for Mae West, along with Jack Chase, along with William Gorilla Jones. You know, separately, you know. But Johnny Bratton must be placed on this list. 100 years. The greatest 150 black fighters of all time. Shout out to Johnny Bratton. John Henry Lewis. Now this was a fighter. He was born May 1st, 1914, Los Angeles, California. He died April 18th, 1974. He was 59 years of age at the time of his death, and he would reside in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, he stood 5 foot 11 inches, had a 75 and a half inch reach. He was a light heavyweight, had a total bout career of 116 fights, 100 wins, 56 knockouts, 11 losses. He was stopped once by Joe Lewis in 1939. And he would have five draws. Now, John Henry Lewis was something else. He was something else. Now, L.O. Cool J's adopted mother had a brother by the name of John Henry Lewis. And L.O. Cool J's, I assume that would be his great uncle, 
But John Henry Lewis was a kin of Tom Molyneux. And Tom Molyneux, you know the story in 1810, would lose to Tom Cribb. And Tom Molyneux was something else. He was the second black fighter. In fact, he was the second fighter from America. Bill Richmond was the first. And they both happened to be black fighters. But John Henry Lewis would be in the ring with Jimmy Butter. At the time, Butter had a record of 42 fights, or 42 wins, 18 losses. He was in the ring with Bobby Brown and Izzy Zinger. October 31st, 1935. He would take on Bob Bowling, St. Louis, Missouri. And he would defeat Bob Bowling. And it would be at that point that John Henry Lewis would become the second black heavyweight, I should say light heavyweight champion of the world. But he would be the first black American light heavyweight champion of the world. Now the first black fighter to be a light heavyweight champion would be Balenciki. But the second black fighter would be John Henry Lewis, but he would be the first of America. And what was interesting about John Henry Lewis, as I stated, he was the light heavyweight champion when he defeated Bob Bowling in 1935. Well, he was still champion in 1938. And that was one of the greatest years for black fighters. Because Joe Lewis was the heavyweight champion in 1938. But Henry Armstrong in 38 was the featherweight, the welterweight, and lightweight champion. They were all black fighters. And this was at a time when it was very difficult to even get a shot at a title if you were a black fighter. Yet many who had some shots, but they were not equal. And this is all part of the history of the black fighter when we do these series. Because you have to understand the struggles that they had in order to judge them in terms of where they rank, where they belong in history. And in this series, we're choosing 150 greatest black fighters. And these fighters in the 30s and the 40s cannot be compared to today's fighters because today's fighters don't have the struggles. They can pick and choose who they want to fight. They can pick up belts and drop belts and there were about 20 belts. So they're different in terms of their resume. But John Henry Lewis was in there with some great fighters. And he himself was a great champion. And he must be added to the list. 100 years. 150 greatest black fighters of all time. We're going to be tough on this list. Curtis and I both took our time and made sure that we tried to choose the best qualified fighters. And it's for their time. It had nothing to do with what other era we're competing them against. It's what they did in their own era who they fought, how did they handle the circumstance. We're quite aware that there were not opportunities for certain fighters that were available to others. But it's what you did with the opportunities that you had. And that's how we're judging. So Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov Series. 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Thanks for hanging in with me. Till the next video. Enjoy your night.